we are going to be 10 billion by 2050. We are going to live on a planet four degrees hotter. We are going to have more mouths and less food. We are going to have less land and more pollution. But we crossed oceans and we defeated diseases. But we went to the moon and we blossomed the desert. Because we are innovators. We are farmers. We are makers. We are dreamers. And we are going to gather and discuss, create and inspire minds and souls. Because we are feeding our future. Good morning. Climate change, an increasing world population, the gradual depletion of natural resources. These are only a few of the issues that nowadays threaten the industries of food production and distribution. And as global food demand has reached an all-time high and is expected to raise by 35% within the next 15 years, the need for innovation and sustainable alternatives has become of vital importance. Our prospects appear favorable, as in an era where technological advancement allows for the development of efficient agricultural methods, it is possible to use precision agriculture to implement farming approaches that cater to our specific needs and enable us to minimize waste. In showcasing forward-thinking attitudes, we can work towards a com common goal, that of maximizing the potential of the land we cultivate. As expressed by the FSA organization, we should believe in the future of agriculture with a faith born not out of the words, but out of deeds. And it is now, in these very rooms, that we begin to take great strides towards a brighter future of agriculture so that our pursuits may resonate around the world. Good afternoon, uh, thank you all to be here. My name is Cristiano Spadoni and I'm very happy to work with uh, this wonderful team. I am a multimedia journalist for Agronotizie that travels uh, all over Italy and not only, all over Europe. Uh, on, uh, we were in the United States uh, last month in order to uh, talk about ag tech, uh, uh, agro-innovation. Uh, and I'm uh, also uh, responsible for marketing for ImageLine. Feel free to share your ideas, uh, your comments. Uh, you will find uh, the Twitter logo on, uh, and some quotes uh, that are uh, 140 uh, char characters uh, friendly, so you can type uh, them in order to share your ideas. Uh, my account is imageline1504, and please use official hashtag SAC17. So we began a tour last year, Last year, on uh, April the 1st, uh, it was uh, not April Fool, but uh, we began it uh, really. And in order to share uh, ideas, uh, stories, uh, to learn from farmers, consultants, and technicians about agro-innovation. Uh, and so it's very interesting today to be here, to listen to the stories and to the ideas, to the projects uh, and the solutions of the speakers uh, that will be after me today. So uh, this is the face uh, that when I talk about precision agriculture to farmers, uh, uh, okay, they look at me like that because uh, I talk about NDVI or uh, farm management systems. Uh, uh, perhaps uh, is there some farmer here in the room? Okay. One farm, okay, thank you very much. So we have a name, we have a goal, we have to disseminate, uh, uh, we have to spread uh, the opportunities of uh, precision agriculture. We have one farmer here, but we have a lot of farmers. In Italy, 1,600,000 farmers. So I have a lot of stories about uh, precision agriculture and digital farming, but I have three minutes or so three stories and three, and three ideas concerning precision farming and digital agriculture. Let's start from uh, Piedmont region. Nino is a rice grower. And what has he achieved? He has uh, achieved uh, 170 euros per hectare savings with variable rate technology and with farm management systems. 
this is an example of the prosecution maps okay, he uses in his farm. Alfio, oh, when I look to this photo, I'm very happy because uh, it's, uh, it's in Chianti region. Uh, anyone knows uh, Chianti region? Uh, raise your hand. Okay, I see some smiles, perhaps because uh, you are thinking about wine. So Alfio uses precision farming and digital farming in order to have a more sustainable wine growing. For example, uh, he has, uh, um, uh, you know, perhaps uh, NGVI in order to understand better how uh, their plant grows. And also Pierpaolo Porcu is from Sardinia, is a technician. He grows artichokes in Sardinia in this beautiful area and he uses farm management systems and uh, digital farming, uh, not only for precision agriculture, agriculture but uh, uh, also to get in touch, to get connected with consumers. In fact, with his uh, farm management system, he can print a QR code and uh, you can see here the QR code uh, on the artichokes uh, in order to let consumers uh, uh, track uh, all the uh, production methods, uh, all the area where these uh, artichokes uh, come from. So uh, at last I have only uh, one minute more uh, to give you my two or better three cents uh, about uh, precision farming uh, and uh, digital farming. So, how we can we how can we achieve this goal? That is, grow more with less inputs, uh, water, time. Uh, perhaps uh, there are a lot of precision farming tools uh, that can help, uh, and uh, I'm very happy to listen to what uh, our uh, to what the speakers uh, will uh, uh, talk about uh, after me. A lot of precision farming tools. This uh, uh, graphic is the uh, uh, Precision Ag Innovation Height Curve. It's, uh, uh, it was called by Forbes uh, the AgTech Adoption Curve. So there are a lot uh, of technologies, but which is uh, the technology that has uh, the best ROI, return on investment? This is the question that I give to the speakers that uh, will be after me. And uh, one last sentence. Uh, for me, digital farming, it's not only about tools, but it's a matter of, of culture. So uh, okay, uh, I said three, but uh, I, won't, I have uh, the last one. So uh, what if uh, we begin to talk about, uh, not pre precision, but decision agriculture, so, so, tra so to transform data and technologies to a uh, new opportunity for farmers and technicians uh, to take uh, decision. Thanks for your attention and thanks for the ideas of next uh, uh, speakers uh, and find out more on imageline.it uh, where you can find also uh, some uh, resources that we conducted uh, in the field uh, in order to uh, give also farmers, technicians, consultants the opportunity to uh, find out more about digital farming and precision farming. So thank you a lot very much uh, and uh, I will be very happy to uh, listen to you now. Bye. Ok, l'agricoltura di precisione, ci sono tantissime uh, definizioni di agricoltura di precisione, set di metodologie, di tecnologie per, um, per incrementare la produzione, la produttività, la qualità delle, delle aziende. In termini appunto qualitativi, per quanto riguarda i prodotti, di sostenibilità per quanto riguarda le aziende. La definizione che mi piace eh, di più è quella di fare la giusta cosa nel posto giusto, nel momento giusto, dove per cosa è proprio il, un input agronomico che noi diamo, eh, seguendo quelle che sono eh, le reali necessità delle piante. L'agricoltura tradizionale tendeva a, a fornire, a, a dare degli input eh, tenendo in considerazione una omogeneità di quelli che erano i sistemi culturali. Mentre utilizzando queste nuove eh, tecnologie e metodologie noi possiamo andare in maniera precisa ed accurata ad andare a, 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 a fornire quegli input necessari solo dove, quando e come eh, per ogni pianta. Eh, la ricerca ha fatto passi avanti, ci sono varie eh, applicazioni dell'agricoltura e precisione stima delle produzioni, appunto mappature 
del suolo e delle piante, mappatura di quelli che sono gli stress biotici e abiotici, eh, nel, negli ultimi anni anche un supporto alla fenotipizzazione, quindi un supporto alla genetica per fornire quelle che sono le, eh, le dinamiche del fenotyping. Poi si parla anche di attuazione, quindi eh, implementazione e supporto alle macchine a ratio variabile, che poi vanno ad attuare quelle che sono, eh, quello che è l'analisi del monitoraggio fatto in, campa, faccio in campo, irrigazione di precisione, ma soprattutto anche eh, dal punto di vista appunto, di, della sostenibilità. Ci sono varie tecnologie che vengono usate, tecnologie ground, quindi monitoraggio agrometeo, tecnologie eh, remote sensing, satellite, aereo, drone, eh, tecnologie che vanno proprio a, a monitorare eh, le singole piante e i frutti. Tutte queste metodologie, tecnologie devono avere una, un minimo comune multiplo, diciamo. Tutti i dati devono essere georiferiti. Il GPS è il, come dire, il cuore che ha fatto nascere l'agricoltura di precisione. Tutta questa mole di dati poi eh, opportunamente elaborata tramite tecnologie anche innovative fa sì che si possa attuare quelle che sono le scelte aziendali in maniera appunto precisa. Quindi è un po' una, un ciclo dal monitoraggio, l'attuazione, la verifica, calibrazione ed è un ciclo continuo che si ripete ogni volta. Questo è un po' un, uh, il concetto di smart uh, qui in viticoltura, quindi tutte queste tecnologie in campo che poi fanno sì che questa acquisizione dati venga uh, poi trasmessa all'agricoltore che in base alle, alle conoscenze del proprio campo riesce poi ad attuare quelle che sono solo delle indicazioni che gli danno il, i sensori. In Italia eh, l'agricoltura di precisione negli ultimi anni sta avendo una, un notevole, eh, una notevole diffusione. Ci sono degli aspetti che contrastano questa diffusione. Quali sono? Gli ambienti fortemente eterogenei, proprio dal punto di vista, cioè ci sono molti ambienti collinari, montani, quindi difficili da monitorare. L'età eh, media delle aziende è abbastanza elevata e il livello di educazione eh, basso, ma soprattutto ci sono una miriade di piccole aziende. Dal punto di vista invece degli aspetti positivi che fanno sì che ci sia una diffusione, eh, soprattutto negli ultimi anni, di queste nuove tecniche, sono eh, l'incremento di consulenze eh, per quanto riguarda le, le aziende agricole, un trasferimento tecnologico sempre maggiore, ma soprattutto anche un incremento dei fondi e dell'occupazione giovanile in agricoltura. Quindi questo crea un fermento. Ci sono ancora degli aspetti da tenere presente per il mainstreaming, per la diffusione dell'agricoltura di precisione, soprattutto per quanto riguarda il training, sia delle conoscenze, sia uh, soprattutto del, dei data tools, cioè non solo si devono creare... Uh, delle simulazioni, ma ci vogliono dei, dei, dei tools, degli strumenti, soprattutto che possano anche identificare quelli che sono ehm, i, i benefici in termini di monetari, in termini di costi. Molte volte questi benefit che anche i ricercatori possono dare alle aziende non sono sempre eh, misurabili, facilmente misurabili, quindi c'è la necessità di sviluppare queste, queste cose. E, anche dal punto di vista tecnologico c'è necessità che eh, si possano utilizzare strumenti più user friendly, che sono più facilmente utilizzabili anche dai proprietari aziendali che eh, insomma, con eh, un livello di educazione anche eh, non troppo alto. E soprattutto condivisione, condivisione tra quelli che sono gli attori della varia filiera, del, quindi non solo aziende, farmers, ricercatori, aziende di consulenze, tutti questi attori già devono interagire insieme, integrarsi per fornire queste indicazioni. Il mio istituto, appunto vi dicevo da dieci anni, si occupa di queste tecnologie come eh, attività, principalmente attività che riguardano il remote sensing, soprattutto da drone, UAV, 
eh, sviluppo e implementazione di wireless sensor networks, e quindi con questi dati agrometeo sviluppo di eh, modelli eh, per le piante, modelli che riguardano vari aspetti, dalla produzione, qualità, ma anche difesa, quindi modelli fitosanitari. Supporto alla fenotipizzazione in campo e infine anche implementazione di sia hardware ma di eh, modelli per la, um, il, la variable rate technology, quindi la eh, management, la gestione fitospecifica. Ehm, per quanto riguarda i droni, il um, remote sensing, soprattutto droni che negli ultimi anni hanno avuto una, una grossa diffusione, quindi una grossa flessibilità in termini eh, di attività con un'altissima risoluzione anche centimetrica di quelle che sono eh, le ehm, proprietà rilevate a terra, ovviamente eh, ottimizzati per medio-piccoli eh, appestamenti, quindi massimo eh, 15-20 ettari, di... mentre con il satellite è possibile monitorare più ampie zone. Ovviamente a volte utilizziamo il drone per fare una sorta di calibrazione per poi eh, ampliare il nostro studio a larga scala utilizzando il satellite. Quali sono le applicazioni che noi utilizziamo sul drone? Dipendono dai sensori del payload che noi eh, equipaggiamo il drone. Camere visibili per eh, il monitoraggio della biomassa, dell'architettura e quindi la realizzazione di modelli 3D, modelli tridimensionali eh, delle piante. Questi ad altissima risoluzione, quindi architettura pianta per pianta. Eh, camere multispettrali o iperspettrali per la misura eh, della, della risposta spettrale della vegetazione, ovviamente definizione di indici di vegetazione quali eh, NDVI, e, insomma, che è quello più, più famoso, eh, ed altri indici che invece possono essere più correlati a, a malattie o stress biotici. Camere termiche per lo sviluppo di eh, modelli e di mappe di stress eh, termico. LIDAR, laser scanner, anch'essi per la ricostruzione 3D. Dal punto di vista del monitoraggio meteo, sviluppo di eh, stazioni low cost e open source per il monitoraggio della variabilità spaziale del microclima, quindi diverse tipologie di sensori, soprattutto a livello di canopy, e eh, utilizzo di, degli stessi sensori anche diciamo, nella chiusura della filiera. Qui stiamo parlando di viticoltura, quindi dalla vigna alla cantina. Sviluppo di ehm, strumenti wireless, wifi, per il monitoraggio della fermentazione eh, del vino direttamente in barrique o in botti. Utilizzando eh, i dati eh, agrometeo provenienti da queste stazioni, molto interessante sempre a livello di agricoltura e precisione, lo sviluppo di modellistica per la previsione della biomassa, della qualità del prodotto finale, ma anche dell'attacco di patogeni, quindi difesa eh, fitosanitaria, eh, lo sviluppo di, eh, di questi modelli per avere un dato in preraccolta di quelle che saranno le condizioni eh, finali. Un'altra eh, tecnologia eh, che negli ultimi tempi è eh, molto interessante è appunto il supporto al field phenotyping, quindi eh, la possibilità di monitorare quantità enormi di eh, genotipi diversi in campo utilizzando sensori a terra o remote sensing appunto per il, il supporto alla, alla selezione genetica, quindi andare a monitorare biomassa, eh, risposte spettrali, altezza, in modo da dare poi un feedback ai genetisti per la selezione di, di queste piante. In ultimo, eh, stiamo sviluppando anche eh, su drone quelli che sono degli attuatori, quindi sistemi che ovviamente non andranno a sostituire quelli che sono i trattori, anche per il punto di vista del, 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 del payload, ma che possono eh, andare ad attuare in casi precisi con determinate tipologie di prodotto, soprattutto in termini di difesa eh, sanitaria. Grazie dell'attenzione. Good afternoon. Technology, when it works, it's great.
Should I wait as well? Yes. We're going to talk about chickens. We're going to go from research to business. Talk about chickens, poultry business intelligence, and how big data can help us produce better chicken and eggs. So we are a spin-off company from Belgium, and we are located in beautiful Leuven, in the center of Belgium. This what was livestock farming in the time of my grandfather. He had a couple of cows, they all had a name, and when Berta was ill, he knew. Today, farming is capital intensive, it's about volume, very small margins, so it's very complex to do it. So, industry 4.0, the first hype word. Industry 4.0 is gonna have a major effect in agriculture in general, and of course also in livestock production. What does that mean? Well, we're gonna, we're gonna take the opportunity of the big data, the IoT, and the cloud, and use the technology to improve our production, to get a better efficiency. Today, on the farms already, there's a lot of technology, sensors present, being able to measure what is really happening in between these animals. So we know something. The animals can start to talk to us about data. I'm talking about the animals, that's important. I'm a livestock scientist. We need to start from the point of view of uh, the animals. It's not IT, and let's apply it to the animal process. It's understanding the animals and its interaction with the environment, which makes it also so complex, that can bring added value. And this farm of these animals is inside a production process that is running up to the, the egg or the chicken filet that you guys are eating and seeing here in the show being beautifully prepared. It's a complete process that comes before that. So we need to understand that process in order to improve it. Now, it starts with data collection. And yes, if everything is good, we're gonna start with automatic data, uh, automatic data collection. Get the data from the farm, from ERP systems at the, um, at the hatchery or at the feed mill. But in reality, not even 20% of the farms can be connected today. So there's also a huge opportunity for IoT companies there. But we have different technologies to collect the data. And in the end, manual, you can always do manual. So easy data collection and build that into an integrated solution. Because as I said, the farm is just a part of a big process leading up to the food product that we are going to make. So we have a web-based solution, software as a service, a business intelligence uh, dashboard. And what can that bring for a poultry business? If you're one farmer and you have one farm, uh, it can bring you the possibility to easily collect the data from the feed that you buy, from the hatchery, so from the genetic information from the animals that you buy, uh, to interact with your veterinarian and to interact with the processor. That's already the value that it can bring. If you're a very big poultry business, you can start collecting data easily from all your farms, compare them, and learn to, and take decisions. So what is the best chicken for me, the best feed, the best veterinarian? And big data for big poultry business, well, I don't have to make a picture with that. Uh, it's uh, on a logarithmic scale that all these data is piling up in such companies. So there was just a term launched about decision agriculture. I'd like to launch another term. We need agrificial intelligence in order to make sense of out of this data so that we can understand and improve the process. So what do we do? We have some solutions there. We have an early warning system. It's a self-learning algorithm which takes into account these chickens in this house at this moment, they are producing in a certain way. We predict the near future to know is everything going well with these chickens or not? And if not, let's give an alarm. And then we need to find reasons why it's going wrong. So you get uh, the classical green, red dashboard to give, this is the feedback to the farmer, to the veterinarian, to the feed consultant. This is how they see the information. When you go one step further, you can start comparing different flocks and you can find problems. Eh? This is the growth curve of broilers. And we see that there's a lot of things happening in the house which makes it suboptimal, and hence we are losing a lot of potential there. So this allows us to find problems and to take action. One step further is that we collect all the data from all the farms with all the information that we can get about the genetics, about the feed, about 
um, you name it, all the fixed parameters, and we can do a complete analysis of all these data together. And then we, we can know from practice what is the real effect of this feed on my egg weight, for instance. Uh, and we used to do trials in small farms and say, okay, if you do this trial with this chicken, we will get better egg weight, or we get better growth. Like this, with the Internet of Things and big data and the cloud, we can make the practice as the real experimental farm. And we have a lot of data from which we can learn. Here is an example. The conclusion was one genetics is better for egg weight than the other one. The next step, when we optimize what's going on on the farm, the farm is just a, a, a part of the complete chain. So when you have all this information on the farm, and you can say for a slaughterhouse, one week or more than one week on bef on beforehand, hey, from this farm you're going to get this type of chicken. Then the slaughtery knows what uh, sources are coming in, and they can optimize their process as well. So that's how we can use this farm data for the next part of the chain. And like that, we predict the end weight of broilers uh, and the variation. So in the end, it's all about adapting existing technology. And the beautiful thing about the fact that we are living in a cloud environment and a big data business, we're all wearing our mobile phones in our hands, we all know that. These technologies have been developed. So it's really the opportunity for our sector to take this technology, combine it with some knowledge about the chickens or about the plants or whatever the process is, and then define solutions. And solutions are not being able to predict. A solution is if you can uh, optimize the complete process from the farm to the complete chain. And you can do that with all the aspects that are relevant for a business starting from the technical, technical, and in the end, honestly, it's all about the, fi the finances, of course. So this is, our, uh, this is our modular solution that we provide to the market today. And with that, I thank you for your attention. I'm Mirko Boschetti from National Resource Council. And I have the opportunity to speak about the activity I'm conducting as a researcher, but also together with a company that is Bonifera Resi that has a stand here. So similarly to what my colleague uh, Alessandro showed before, I'm an expert in remote sensing. So in a sky from high, in a high from a sky, sorry. Uh, so what is the contribution that we can have from those data to, to the innovation in agriculture? So the idea is that uh, the new agriculture 4.0 is as already said by the other speaker, is to, in, to produce innovation on the entire process, from the data to the decision. So it's the idea is to be uh, impacting in the real farming world, is to provide a digital innovation in uh, uh, the decision-making process. So this is something, it's a connection of what started in the 90s that was related mainly on the introduction on the market of uh, on the new tractors, on the new machinery th with the GPS uh, guide. But it's not only that, it should be more. Otherwise, since the, the, the early 2000s, we have this machinery, but as we see here, we are speaking about innovation, something that is not yet uh, applied in the real world. This is because we need to um, complete the loop. And one of the objectives of who is uh, doing this uh, as a business is to provide technology for the farmer to produce more with less, as already said before, and then to produce products that should be at less cost for the consumer, but a higher quality. So we don't have to produce craft products, but better healthy products. And nevertheless, to have uh, a company improvement of the royalties. So the idea is that it's a complete process, okay? From the analysis of the farm, and then the decision of which is the objective that they have to produce in terms of so the market opportunity, then we have to plan the activity, of course, to buy the instrumentation, but also to acquire the data, also wireless data like the colleague presented before, and the analysis. This is the principal and more important part, to take the decision and then, at the end, verify if we have a benefit about that. So my uh, expertise in this part, in the data acquisition and data analysis, I'm a remote sensing uh, researcher, and remote sensing started when a French uh, photographer decided to take the first picture from a balloon, and this is the picture of 
very so narrow by that. And of course, also we had the first UAV system when someone decided to strap a camera on a pigeon and from those cameras they take those kind of pictures. We know this is the historical reason. Now we are in the drone age area and uh, Alessandro show which is the potentiality of drone age. But I'm more uh, expert in what is from satellite. Satellites are available since ages, but uh, we are also in a new era from the satellite and I'm proud to be as European to contribute worldwide with this mission from the European Space Agency and European Commission. Those are the uh, Sentinel uh, um, platforms that are available and the, these three s Sentinel, Sentinel 1, 2 and 3, are of particular important for agriculture. And one of the important things that is a new era for that, they are free of charge and operational. So operational means that we can have every, f oh sorry, I'm going back, okay. That we can have every five days images, this is of a land area in uh, close by to Milano where we produce rice. Every five days we can have a 10 meter resolution images that for the application in precision farming and for the monitoring of farm is, are of extremely important and represent for this reason a new era. Of course we have the clouds, but when we have five days of revisiting cycle, we are sure that we can provide something better for the farming decision. So what is the contribution from our data, from satellite data? Of course it's a synoptic view, we can see wide area. In a multi-temporal dimension, it means that we can monitor how the crops grow. We, ha we have a multi-spectral multi vision, it means that we can provide information much more than what our eye can see. And of course, the capacity to detect, uh, which is the spatial variability of the phenomena at different resolutions, for instance, about some meter or even some centimeter if we have the drones. And what we can get from this multi-sensor approach or multi-temporal approach, optical or other sensor, we can detect the different culture or crops that are cultivated. We can see which is the variability of the soil before the crop is installed which are the dates of the processing in, in the fields, and in particular, which is the status of the crop in terms of vigor and in terms of potential water stressor. And this is in time. So all those information can be put together to support the farming system. This is the basis of the project I'm coordinating for Bonifera Resi, it's called Sat Farming, it's the basing of this technology. The uh, company is uh, the biggest company in Italy, so with the widest uh, um, uh, farm dimension. This farm in Ferrara is about 5,000 hectares, and they already have provided, acquired a lot of digital information for the farms, from the soil maps to the resistivity that is made with the quad and with a sensor that is able to see the resistivity, electric, electric, electric conductivity of the soil. And of course, what we are contributing in that is in providing this, the satellite monitoring. That allowed, since the 2016, to monitor, for instance, here, a maize field, corn field, where we see the vigor of the field in June, in August, and this is the resistivity map that was made by the quad. And we can see that the anomaly that we detect in August is exactly the same picture of the final yield. So if we, meet, if we are able to handle the situation between the data and the final yield, we can support that. And what we did, we start with the winter crops, in particular with the sowing. So we analyzed the soil uh, characteristics, the texture, the past uh, yield maps, and of course using the satellite archive, which it was the response of the crop in the, in the different land. And we, could be, we were able to, to produce maps to modulate the sowing also of the different density of the seeds. So we produce the map, then we put the map on the display of the tractor and thanks to the smart um, uh, machinery, we could have more than 1,000 hectare or so in different fields. But we did more, and so we started to monitor after the sowing. And again, thanks to this satellite European sensor, free of charge again and uh, operational, we have this picture acquired in late April, a few weeks ago. So this uh, uh, color composite with a false infrared, from that we define the fertiliza nitrogen fertilization for all those areas, and then from the fertili for nitrogen fertilization we produce the uh, prescription maps that were used in the tractors 
and uh, so the fertilization was government with a uh, decision superstition based. One of the problems when we, uh, uh, one other speaker say that we have to be uh, user friendly. One of the problem is that in my, in, in for my job that I'm a researcher that we can do everything nice have in our computer in or in our Dropbox close to, to, to the office, but we have to deliver that to, to the final users. So what are also important is to have some uh, web service that are able to discover the data produced, but also to acquire, upload the data that are produced, and then after that can be downloaded or directly put it in the system of the machinery. So in conclusion, what uh, we are doing and what is necessary is that uh, some technology are already available, the satellite one, the webs, the webs one, to uh, generate and disseminate information to the final user to produce more uh, sustainable uh, the agricultural production. What we saw is that there are a lot of pieces of this puzzle and what is necessary, is necessary to complete the whole picture, to conclude the puzzle is to have a hub, a body that is able to coordinate all those, those activities, to put the know-how existing together, but also to see where is the gap that have to be filled in terms also of research. So what we found is with this company, Bonifio Ferraresi, to have the opportunity as CNR, also we were speaking together with our colleague that was possible in the future, to produce services of what is called Agriculture 4.0. And then of course to go more than just the tools, the uh, tractors, and to produce knowledge that can uh, improve the, uh, uh, what we want, to produce more with less. Okay, thank you very much. Hi, my name is Marissa Roland and I'm the VP of product at Arable. So Arable is a data analytics company that reduces risk throughout the food and agricultural supply chain by making predictions on quantity, quality, and harvest timing. So let's back up and take a look at the current state of agriculture. Uh, in the US alone, there's over 1 billion farmed acres with about 2 million farmers and roughly 2,000 crop advisors. If we do the math, that adds up to only a few seconds per acre per year that any individual can spend in the field. So really quickly, what that means is uh, we don't know how much is out there and in what state and when it will be ready, let alone if it's in marketable condition. Um, or if you really want to put your brand label on that. Um, so we, if we think about the growing, um, the growing season, a uh, grower is out there making decisions based on factors under their control uh, for a desired outcome. But we all know in agriculture that uh, events can and do vary and they will, by a lot. Um, so what we're doing is by understanding the relationship between the crop, its environment, and how that relationship unfolds over time, we're reducing that risk and that uncertainty. So some of that, those kind of pain points for growers or producers um, would be knowing when and how much water to irrigate uh, is there really any risk of disease in the field? Do I need to spray? Um, you know, processors or producers are trying to make decisions dynamically on, um, you know, how much do I have to sell? Am I really going to have that much in, at that time? Um, and so forth. So, um, what makes us different is that we've created a device that takes in over 40 different measurements on uh, not only the microclimate and weather, but also the plant growing itself. So we're in the field continuously watching as the plant goes from throughout different stages, but also seeing how it's responding to those different stressors in field level conditions. So we worked with the designers behind the GoPro and Nest and Fitbit uh, to create this device with over 40 different streams. Um, and so it's measuring, it's, it's really a souped up weather station 
But it's not only measuring, like I said, the weather, it's measuring the crop itself. So it's measuring air temperature, relative humidity, pressure, but it's also has a spectrometer on it. So it's taking in um, plant vigor, water stress. Um, it's taking in chlorophyll content, et cetera. Uh, it also has an acoustic disdrometer. Uh, so the device is actually listening to the exact amount of rain that is falling in any given place. Um, and we're not only getting the amount of rain, but we're also getting the distribution. So that, that's related to kind of crop damage as well. Um, and the device itself has an auxiliary port. So that's what makes it plug and play. Um, we understand that growers have different measurements that they're interested in, whether it's uh, wind speed or it's soil moisture. Uh, they can use the auxiliary port to plug in whatever device or measurement that they'd want in addition to ours. So all of these measurements are being sent to the cloud through Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, or cellular uh, so that these enterprises, inter enterprises and growers can make decisions on a field level. So here you can see kind of the current state of uh, the software. Uh, on your left, you have a view where they can see what is going on immediately in the field. Um, we give both what are the current conditions as well as what are the forecasted conditions, but they can really search through any of those other metrics like water stress. And on the right, we give a view that allows growers to kind of quantitatively benchmark um, and look at what are the trends, uh, what are the anomalies. And so once they spot those, they can jump into these different views, which give them, once again, I can't stress this enough, the, the field level conditions, as well as the proactive kind of plant monitoring screen that lets them know what's the water stress, what's the, the plant health, how is it growing, and what are those trends, as well as we calculate uh, evapotranspiration. Uh, and like I said, we have the precip. So over the past year, we've been working with a large berry producer uh, to work on forecasting of crop uh, yield. And we've been able to reduce that to 95%. Uh, well, we've been able to get it to 95% accuracy. So we've reduced their 20% error uh, down to 5%. Um, and so that's saving them on average around five to, or that mistake of not knowing how much is in their field costs them five to seven million dollars per week. And so if we really quickly take a closer look at this case study, their forecasts were inaccurate to 10 to 20 percent, and we got down to five percent. This was costing them $25,000 a week per field. And we are able to create $18,000 of uh, newfound value. So Arable captures, aggregates, and analyzes historic and real-time crop and weather data to create models that predict timing, quality, and yield. Right now, we're out in processing tomatoes, strawberries, wine grapes, nut crops, stone fruit and orchards. We're also out in some commodity crops as well, such as corn and soy. So the specialty crop market is defined by supply chain risk. 30% of all agricultural products are lost in the field they, because they just don't make it to where they're, they're destined to be. Um, and so that's a waste of $2.4 trillion. And that's not only a financial waste, that's a waste of resources, of water, um, of labor, of pesticides. Uh, so, we're arable, we're uh, reducing supply chain risk. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Craig Gansel, and I'm the founder and CEO of Basecamp Networks out of the United States near Atlanta, Georgia. So, the breadth of tools in precision agriculture. Agriculture is one of the oldest industries in the world, right? We all need to eat, okay? And how many tools have we had along the way and have we pioneered? 
We started with tractors that were pulled by horses. We started in machinery. Now we have precision planters. We have drones. But what about this? I always tell people this right here is either a toy or a tool. And that decision is up to the user. You can play games on it, you can message people, but this can become a really powerful tool. And this has been around for, smartphones have been around for a little bit, about a decade or so. And so what are we gonna have tomorrow when it comes to tools in agriculture? We're already onto watches, everything is in the cloud. What about smart glasses? Has anybody seen this before? Anybody know what this is? This came out in 2013 by Google, and Basecamp Networks had the pleasure of working with Google in this wearable device known as Google Glass, and this is one of the newer versions, to bring a heads-up display to agriculture where we could use image recognition, artificial intelligence, and machine learning algorithms to simply take a picture of a crop and tell us what it is, what pathogen it has, what pest might be on it, what's going on with that particular crop. We even were able to uh, perform certain counting functionalities, such as counting kernels on an ear of corn in about two seconds. There is a lot happening in the field in agriculture. There's a lot of farm management systems. Machinery is putting off a lot of data. And wouldn't it be nice if there was an artificial intelligence, a neural network, a brain of some kind that was capturing everything and spitting back out intelligent data based off the actionable insights that we captured from the field. And that is what the IntelliScout platform was built to do. We're not out to reinvent the wheel and have another farm management system. We're not trying to compete with all the soil moisture uh, and nitrogen and phosphorus reading sensors that are in the ground, or all the drones that are taking magnificent data for hyperspectral color imagery. We thought we would capture everybody else's data that wanted to put it into something like Watson for Agriculture, but a little bit better. I had mentioned that we're able to count. So imagine for a minute that you could hold up an ear of corn take a picture with glasses or with a smartphone, and in about two seconds, have an over 95% accurate count. And that's what it looks like on IntelliScout. We've done this with uh, nodes on cotton plants. We've done it with the tiny little bumps on a raspberry. We've done it with hundreds of pests on leaves of different plants. And we work in a lot of row crops, and we're working in some citrus, and we're working in uh, uh, some different vegetables and all kinds of different crops. So we want to be able to bring actionable insight in near real time transmission. There's a lot that happens from the time seeds go into the ground till we harvest them towards the end of the year. And so of everything that happens in between, how do we capture all of that data and get it to the people that need it to make decisions immediately. Decisions equal progress. We just saw a few moments ago of how few people there are in the field actually taking uh, pictures or gathering data. And so we have to have something that will allow us to do it a whole lot faster. And a lot of people are carrying one of these around already. We wanted to make IntelliScout intuitive that people would be able to use devices that they carry every day and simply launch an application and capture data from the field. Some people want to do it hands-free, and that's where things like Google Glass will come into play, but there will be other heads-up displays that will come out in the future, I'm sure. This is what IntelliScout looks like on the iOS app. We take a really clear picture it tells us in the field report what the weather was when we took it, where we were, how many we have, and you can see the machine has put a label across the image. It tells us it's northern corn leaf blight, it's healthy, it's sweet corn armyworm, and it gives us a number which is a severity rating. 
In most instances, in taking a field report, we have had 99 to 100% accuracy in pathogen and pest identification of what it is that we see on the crop. And we've had about 70 to 75% accuracy on the severity rating. And part of that is we can't get pathologists in the industry to agree on the severity. One thinks it's 30% and another says, no, I think maybe that's 40 or 50% severity. IntelliScout is intended to be one of those tools in the future of agriculture that will allow you to capture data and get results almost immediately. Thank you. Hello, I am Eleni, co-founder of Agrology. We are based in Greece, in Athens and Crete, and we are obsessed with technology that has to apply in agriculture. A few years ago, we came along with a problem. We know that 70% of blue water around the world goes to irrigation every year, which means that it's a lot and we need to take care of it. And we know also that irrigation on its own as a process is tedious because it's been its labor job. It's time consuming because basically in most of the Mediterranean countries, um, the plots are not big, but they are a lot, which means that a lot of different people have to visit every plot uh, specifically in order to open and close irrigation. It's costly because it's labor work again and because there are a lot of commute costs that get along in the way. And it leads to water waste because most of the times it's done by experience and not by um, any guide that farmers have. So this is where agrologists come. We help farmers manage irrigation via the smartphone any place, any time. We want it to be done simply and affordably with three steps. We have a three-piece device that has sensors, soil sensors and air sensors, and it has electrovolt controllers, which means that any farmer, he can use his, his smartphone, download the, ag the agrologist app, log in, and by just clicking a button, literally, he can open the closed electrovolt in the field. All we need is 3G network. We know that all farmers are techie. They need solutions that they can use on their own without the, the help of an agronomist or a technician. They need solutions that are affordable because they cannot afford to, to spend a lot of money for all the kinds of different crops they might have. They need them to be plug and play. They need to understand that technology can be that easy. They can buy something and install it in a crop. And most of all, it needs to be applicable in small scale farming because we are in the Mediterranean and most of the farmers in the Mediterranean are small scale. So with that dream, we started in 2014 where we joined CJIU in Arizona, in Phoenix. We received there our first small funding, which is the only one we have until here. Uh, we're pretty much bootstrapped since then because we're Greeks and we live in Greece, which is not, not the most startup friendly country in the world. And since then, we have achieved to have better users all around the country and have collaborations with some of the biggest organizations around Europe, such as um, Startup Bootcamp in Rome and the Wageningen University. And most of all, we have been member of the Agriant Accelerator, the first accelerator for agtech in Greece. All these were done by four people. Mike, our founder and our lead developer. Me, the only girl in the team who does all the managerial jobs, so you know who the real boss is by the end of the day. By Panos and Yanis, who are based uh, in the UK, in Portsmouth, and do a lot of job for us up there. Three key members have been with us through all this time. 
the Agriant Accelerator, where all the founders of the Accelerator have proven to be our mentors. They work, they, they work every day with us across the line. They help us improve and do all the steps that we need to do in order to come to the end of creating our device. Honor Tech, uh, a company that specializes in uh, technology engineering in Greece, and they have been kind enough to help us uh, conclude and create all the R&D process through these years. And the Agricultural Cooperation in Males, Ierapetra, the island of Greece, uh, which have been our first um, beta users and have been working with us since our beginning. So, we know that farmers have more than 99 problems, that's for sure. And when we created Agrology, we wanted this, irrigation not to be one more problem for them. Thank you very much. You can find us at stand B07 and we would welcome you and talk with you, chat with you and exchange ideas. Thank you. Hi. Every year around the world, we kill 3.2 billion chicks right off the hatching. 3.2 billion. We don't use them. They don't produce eggs. Why is that? It's, it's quite simple, because they're male. And male chickens don't lay any eggs. So right after hatching, we separate the males and the females by hand. There's people doing that. We sell the females, and the males get either suffocated or shredded. It's quite terrible for animal welfare, and it's a big in, in, industry problem in the poultry sector. My company in Elvo is developing a solution for that. We are developing a gender test for the egg. So instead of the chick, we genotype the egg. It means we don't have to hatch these chicks. We don't have to kill them. We don't have to stress them out. It's way better for animal welfare. And it's also better for efficiency. So you make a combination. And it's really needed at the moment because in the last two years or so, this issue, it's, I mean, not a lot of people know the poultry industry, but in the poultry industry, this is one of the main, main challenges, basically. And in, in countries like France and in Belgium and in, in, in Germany, people have been trying to, to ban the killing of chicks, but there's no alternative to this practice. It makes total sense to be killing chicks right now, but we are creating an a alternative. And we're doing it in, in quite a, an interesting uh, consortium, actually. We work together with um, our Ministry of Economic Affairs, our government, Leiden University, we're spin-off from Leiden University, we work together with industry, so the hatcheries, the layer hatcheries, the Netherlands, they all work together with us. And also the most important NGO on animal welfare in the Netherlands is also in our consortium. And it's kind of interesting to think about because normally you would expect these guys to be fighting the government with the farmers, with, with the NGOs. But actually on this topic, everyone wants to get rid of it. All have their own, own opinion or own reasons for it, but they all support us and they feed us with information on what's acceptable and what not, and they give us access to resources. It's been quite a nice collaboration. Now, how does it work? We, we actually come, I don't come from the poultry industry, I didn't grow up on a farm, or I come from, from biology and mostly from the pharma type of biology. And in pharma, a lot of people are trying to figure out how to find someone who's ill and find out why someone is ill. So typically they would take some samples, in this case some blood, of someone who's ill and someone who's not ill, and they analyze it and they try to figure out what the differences are. And if you find those differences, you can spot who's, who's ill and you can treat them better. Well, the, the, the issue of the male, male eggs and the female eggs, in this case the males are sick, right? That's, that's basically how we've been treating it. Don't, don't take pictures, by the way, this is just caffeine. We actually analyze thousands of eggs and we tried to look at different tissues, different time points in development. And we found a number of these biomarkers, we call them. They're our secret sauce. And based on those biomarkers, we are now able to say what the gender of a, an egg is, and we can still hatch it. And we've actually done that. Um, last year, a couple of batches of, of eggs, we, we tested, we separated, 
on, on day nine of development, and we let them hatch. So on the left, these are females, they're brown, and the males, they're yellow. Easier to sex them by hand like that. And we've been able actually to, to do this, and our, our measurement takes about 0.6 seconds per egg, which brings it to reality, basically. We can, we can now put that in the hatchery, and that's actually what we're doing right now, because I, I can't be checking all those eggs, right? <laughs> um, we're now working together with the industry to automate this. We have to do 100,000 eggs a day, which is not easy, I can tell you, but it is achievable, and we're working on that right now. Now, it's interesting to think about, if you take a step back, um, how we sort of shift the paradigm with this. Because if you guys, as consumers, are in the supermarket and you're buying eggs or meat, you get a choice. And a lot of people take one choice, and that is, I want cheap meat or cheap eggs, and the animal suffers. Or the other way around, you pay more, and the animal doesn't suffer that much. That's, your, that's the paradigm, that's what you, you have to choose for right now. But with my company, I believe that if you use technology, you can actually come up with cases in which it's better for the, for the animal, and it's better for the farmer. So the, the farmer makes money, the animal has a better life. And that's the type of products we want to create. We have two more products in the product line right now, in the pipeline. And I'm totally convinced that as an industry, as an agricultural industry, but the poultry industry should embrace this because the thing is, if you can come up with these type of technologies, all consumers will like it, will pay for it, and poultry farmers will, will, will be benefited by it. So we're trying to solve a, a major issue in the, in the poultry industry. We're, we're quite nice, well on our way. In 2018, we want to launch our product. Before that, we've tested it already. Um, we like collaboration quite a lot. So let's say you are interested in, or whatever, just approach me, that uh, uh, I'll be here for the next two days. Um, and we believe in collaboration. Because I think these type of issues will not be solved. They're too big to be solved by one single company, one startup, or whatever. We need to collaborate. And that's what we're trying with the consortium. And if you feel you can contribute, please, please help. Because we need it. Thank you very much. Hello, buenas tardes. Um, continue in English if that's okay. It seems to be the uh, the, the trend here. Um, my name is Adam Smith, um, co-founder and director of Kakasi. Uh, we're from the U.S. Uh, and based in uh, Silicon Valley. Here we have two tomatoes. Um, they're very similar in appearance. Uh, their color, their size. Uh, how, how can we tell them apart? Can we? Is there any difference? They're tomatoes. Well, personally, I know that there is a difference because the one on the left, I grew myself. I watched it from seed. I watered it all the way up until uh, I harvested it and, and enjoyed the hell out of it. The one on the right, on the right, I just simply purchased at a supermarket without really thinking too much of it. The point is, is that all food has a story, and we've lost the connection to where our food comes from, and and what goes into its production. You know, the, the U.S. food market is not like any other food market in, in the entire world. Um, in the 1980s, we saw the rise of the organic uh, market, which is now uh, close to $100 million, billion dollars, uh, leading to 2008-ish with the financial crisis and uh, the growth of the local food movement. Now we're in a battle of labels where transparency is trending. In a recent study, showed that 25% uh, of consumers are willing, or excuse me, 50% of, of consumers are willing to pay 20% uh, or more for products that offer full transparency in all attributes. So where's this, where, where is all this leading? Uh, transparency is, is creating markets and defining new ones. We're, we're creating labels to uh, uh, sort of legitimize consumer trends but, but where does it all end? Uh, well, for us, we wanted to see, actually see where our food ki comes from. And so we invented this. This is Kikasi. Uh, this is the first uh, camera that has been specifically developed to monitor and record plant growth. Um, also, you can't separate farming from weather, so we have internal sensors that can measure key weather data, such as temperature, day length, humidity, 
um, rainfall and other uh, external sensors that will measure soil moisture and, and sap flow uh, within plants as well. At the same time, the device takes a picture and offers, can offer full transparency to consumers using time-lapse video. We've designed the device for an ease of implementation. It's maintenance-free. Um, it runs entirely on solar power and operates on a, a cellular network with a, uh, our global partner uh, has operations in over 120 countries without us ever having to change any SIM. Now the data we collected, it's got to be useful for, for farmers. So you know, just providing them with it in a raw format is not beneficial, so we model it and provide access to a dashboard where the farmers are able to track where the specific conditions on the farm and, and kind of a have actionable insights. Additionally, you know, we're, we're looking at our, and pioneering this authenticity labeling and, and trans, uh, transitioning the focus on uh, certification to more of communication and, um, and enhancement of actual products. Because when you know more about where your food comes from, you're able to enjoy it more and pay more for it. So offering this full transparency consumers brings them back to the farm. It brings them the enjoyment of, that I experienced in, in, in sort of in watching the tomato grow in my yard. I had a greater appreciation for it and uh, was able to just understand more of its process. Additionally, because as we deploy these devices, uh, more and more of them we're collecting a lot of data, a lot of image uh, data that is, uh, can be correlated with weather data. Um, we're partnering with image recognition uh, software companies to use that as a way of automating farm logging um, so that we can understand you know, at certain times, it's, uh, at certain life, uh, at a certain life cycle of the plant, what activities are going on on the farm. And, and we all know that with agriculture, we need more AI and more robotics, and we can take this information and apply it in an automation, in an automation scenario to bring agriculture into the 21st century, Ag, ag 4.0 and, and, uh, and the future of farming. Now, our business model in the United States is one where we're not selling directly to farmers in most cases, but we're working with distributors, those that are making profit off of offering transparency to consumers. At a low monthly fee, $50 per month, uh, we lease the devices uh, with access to the dashboard for farmers, as well as API access for integration into existing uh, marketing channels so that brands can differentiate themselves or supermarkets can can offer a new level of transparency to consumers. We're creating a global network where the devices can be installed in at, with, with very ease, just simply switch it on and put it on the field in, in over 120 countries, like I mentioned, from, from lettuce in Japan to coffee in Colombia to wine in Italy, organic farms in the US and uh, cacao in Japan, we're creating a network of de these devices that are collecting data, imagery on a daily basis, and, uh, and providing insights to farmers. With that, our international business model is one where we're working with agencies and distributors in each country to help us provide those devices to the farms in, 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 in that specific uh, scenario. Because agriculture differs greatly from, from country to country, especially uh, when it comes to uh, applying technology in, in certain uh, scenarios. We have an international team of farmers, researchers, serial entrepreneurs, and marketers. Um, I have a, a background in agriculture. My family has a farm in Georgia with the cotton and peanuts. And for the past eight years, I've been working in, in on the technology side of, of agriculture from either distribution to now uh, uh, in, uh, providing information services. Um, our CEO, Taizo Otsuka, is, is a serial entrepreneur and has uh, started over 14 different companies, um, ranging from an uh, NBA basketball or uh, Jap Japanese national basketball team to um, uh, nonprofits that are uh, working to uh, promote farming in Japan. We're excited to be here at this Seeds and, Chip, Seeds and Chips conference. It's been a dream of mine for a while. We'll be here all week and looking forward to uh, discussing uh, our product with you and, and looking for uh, 
you know, establishing partnerships in Europe and, and really throughout the world. So uh, if you're interested, please come and find me and uh, I'll be looking forward to chatting. Thank you. I promise that I'm last, so just hang in there for a little bit. When you look at this apple, you see its size and its color. I take a look at the same piece of fruit, and I see a fruit that was sprayed 18 times this season instead of 12. My name is Ayala Meets from Fielden, and we're a company that provides a pest management software service that's designed specifically for orchards and vineyards. We help some of the largest growers across California, Israel, and Italy to save money on better crop protection practices, reducing overall use of pesticides and completely eliminating spray mistakes. We offer a sensor that will make any tractor smart, and along with the sensor, we provide system dashboards to support decision making in real time across the entire pest cycle, from planning to execution to analysis. We have one focus, one target in mind, and that is to track pesticide use from every tree, in every row, in every field, to make sure that we're improving the quality and the safety of the fruits and nuts that we put in our mouths. When it comes to pest management, you really can't be too careful. Every year, $14 billion are spent on pesticide products specifically for fruits and nuts, and yet growers, chemical companies, packing houses, retailers, us consumers, of course, have no idea whatsoever as to how these pesticides are applied. No visibility. It's like a black hole. We've monitored more than 20,000 individual sprays in 2016, and we now understand that pest management is like an accident waiting to happen. This black hole, on average, translates into one out of four sprays going wrong. Too much spraying, too little spraying, unnecessary spraying, spraying when the tractor goes too fast, spraying when the weather conditions aren't right, spraying the wrong materials or the wrong block at the wrong time, you name it. But there's one common denominator to all, and that's that nobody knows. Because you don't know what you don't know. We do know. When growers start to work with field, and very quickly they begin to realize that what happens in the field isn't always in line with what they had planned. I'll show you a quick example. If you could play the video, please. This is an almond field for a large almond grower in California. We see two rigs that are spraying, and our sensors will tell us not just where they're traveling, but where they actually spray, at what velocity, at what volume, coverage rates, activity time, and a bunch of other attributes that are currently not known to growers. The only thing that a grower knows at this point in time is whether or not a spray took place, yes or no. Was there a spray? Yes. Was it good? No. You can see right here, two rows were missed. This is something that happens to a lot of our customers, and it happens a lot. In fact, for this enterprise grower, insufficient treatment alone is costing this grower about $600,000 annually, and you can add that to the millions that they're already spending on pest management, which typically constitutes about 15 to 20% of a grower's seasonal expenditures. And this is exactly where fielding comes into play. We combine data in real time from the field, be it scouting information, aerial imagery, weather information, sensor data. So in effect, we know what's the pest and disease situation in the field in any given moment in time. We know what the grower is planning to do about it. We understand what actually happened. And therefore, since we have a baseline, we can tell if there were any discrepancies or devi uh, deviancies in the way. This is really the first time that in the nut and fruit business, growers have full visibility and no doubts or guessing about what's going on in the field. And when I say growers, I mean every single stakeholder involved in the process. It starts with the field scouts that can now move to the 21st century and start capturing their data digitally with a scouting app. The pest control advisors, who are the people that decide when to spray, how to spray, and why to spray, can suddenly put different pieces of data into context. The growers and the applicators themselves have real-time view of the spray applications, and they can also revisit them later on in retrospect to analyze if there were any mistakes. And when you combine all this spray information from the entire process, you're suddenly giving farm managers and you're giving executives in the large organizations the bigger picture that they've never seen before. 
using big data insights. And really, data is the big, the big story here. We process 150,000 data points every single day. We are now creating a benchmark for the first time that can help us understand not just what's going on in the field, but what's going on in the field in context. Different farm teams, different products, different spray techniques, different pesticides used. Just in 2016, we've been able to answer questions about application timing, efficiency comparisons, um, and regional analytics. And I want to show you a few of these examples. I call this a pure money slide. Every time a grower sends out to the field a, a sprayer, they're paying money for the equipment, they're paying money for the labor, and they're paying money for the pesticides themselves. And we're asking a very simple question. In an eight to 10 hour shift, how much time is that tractor spending on just spraying and not doing anything else. This is all data from one organization spread across different farms. If you look at farm number three, efficiency rate is pretty average. With the good farmers that have very good efficiency rates, we see around 87, 88%. But then you look at farm number, farm number seven. On farm number seven, 12 or 13 minutes out of every hour, the tractor isn't moving. Whether it's unjust or, or, or just, we don't know. But we do know that the farmer is paying money here and not getting the buck for their dollar. We can dive deeper into regional analytics because what growers really care about, aside from what's going on in their operations, they want to know how they compare to others. They want to know how their peers are doing. So we're looking at a wine grower and specifically just a specific type of variety. We're looking at Cabernet Sauvignon sprays and we're telling them, look, in your region, in your area, the average spray is 7.3 sprays per block. You're spraying 30% more. You're spending double. We don't know why, but we want to put this to your attention. We want you to start asking these types of questions. Another important thing to realize is not just what are the pesticides that growers are buying, but rather understanding what is the pesticide that they are applying and when they're applying them. And this is what we're doing here for a citrus grower. We're basically accumulating data from a bunch of different citrus growers in multiple areas, and we're looking at a specific pest type, at citrus smite rust. And in the bottom here, we're looking at the active ingredients, uh, and we've purposefully uh, not named the product names, of course. Um, this helps us understand what growers are using, when they're using them, and just how efficient they are. Ultimately, What's nice about fielding is the fact that we collect information that stems from the field, which makes it more accurate, more favorable, and perhaps the number one cause that's most important for growers, 100% actionable. These are insights that they know what to do with. We're not just putting it there for them. It's our job to point their attention to the quality of the spray operations, and ultimately we're helping them on three counts. First and foremost, reduce the number of sprays. We know that by, by large, most of the growers are spraying in excess, mostly because they just don't know what's going on in their field. We also want to increase their efficiency rates by maximizing output and keeping downtime to a minimum. We've seen that happen oftentimes fairly quickly. And third, we want to make sure that the produce that they do deliver to the packing houses can actually be sold. Because in our business, in the US alone, we see that in the fruit and nuts, about 10% of the produce doesn't even leave the packing house. It just can't be sold, namely due to pests and diseases. Now, that's, this is produce that the grower has already invested money in. And we want to make sure that they're getting a return on their investment. How do we know this, this works from a business perspective? Well, I can share with you that in California, we're working with some of the most prominent nut and wine producers uh, in the state. Uh, one good example is that we're currently monitoring the entire spray operations for the largest almond grower in the world. Um, that's about 40,000 hectares. Um, or 100,000 acres, if you will, um, monitoring just about 62 spray, uh, uh, spray rigs simultaneously. In Israel, we're already working with all the major growers and all the major grower organizations. Every third citrus, I'm sorry, every third orange that comes out of Israel is monitored by Fielden, and every fourth grape. We know that it works because we're getting paid. What's nice about Fielden is that you get growers that are looking to see immediate value, and with Fielden, they see it within days. There's nothing much to explain. Once you show them mistakes, you show them where they could do better, they're willing to pay for it. 
And we do that through a simple subscription fee that works. So in summary, let me just say two things that I want you to remember about Fuelden. The first is that we're creating a data-driven traceability standard to optimize growing protocols and make sure that there's full visibility across the value chain, not just for the growers, but for the packing houses who buy from the growers and from the retailers who buy from the packing houses, and ultimately all the way to the consumer. And secondly, we're creating a knowledge base. We're benchmarking the industry, and we're creating a new standard here to make sure that every fruit and every nut that comes into our mouth meets and hopefully exceeds the standard. Thank you.